right. So we, we have obviously question. been part of uh, <laughs> we have obviously been part of conversations where people don't think that they need a training plan or a training coach. Uh, but the reality is that even as active duty operators, we still have training plans. We still have training coaches. But if you're not already in uh, in and as an operator in special tactics, where do you go? Trent, where do you go? I go to my man, Kevin Edgerton. He runs 18 Alpha Fitness. He's been through uh, a few different selection courses and worked in a few different selection courses. I've, I've personally seen the results of his work in the uh, the Air Force uh, selection process, and uh, his results are amazing. So uh, not only has he been through the courses and knows what he's doing, but he also has all the credentials to back it up. Uh, so he's very educated. And, um, yeah, he's, he's a person I trust not just with me but with my family when it comes to uh, fitness and recovery and all those other types of things. And uh, also, I think jujitsu as well, right, Aaron? I think you're the jujitsu guy. He is. Has Kevin ever hurt you? Well, uh, he he actually has. Kevin and I have rolled together. So that's the great thing about Kevin, right, is he he literally practices what he preaches. He's out there. He's testing all of his programs. He's working out. If he's not video coaching and he's not doing something by distance, man, he is down in the trenches still. And that guy has had a, a long career. He's a 20-year special forces guy. Uh, ended up being a strength and conditioning coach. And now here he is with with standardized plans for everybody. Like, hey, if you want to go to special forces, he's got that base framework, but he does individualized plans and does individualized coaching for you as well. So it's not just something you're going to buy and he says, hey, you're off and you're on your way. He's engaged literally from the start of your journey all the way to the end. He's got a great track record with getting people ready for assessment selection. And, and like I said, man, there's nothing better than somebody that's actually doing the things that, that you're doing as well and, and seeing from some success from. So head on over to uh, 18alphafitness.com. That's 18alphafitness.com. You can find his entire website. You can also find him on Instagram at 18alphafitness. It's the easiest way. Just hit him up. Use our code one ready. Uh, you can hit Kevin up direct on the DMs and that'll get you a discount. And uh, once again, 18alphafitness.com. If you want to get ready and you want to get into the pipeline, whatever that pipeline is, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Kevin can get you there. And he's got the experience to do so. So go check him out, 18 Alpha Fitness. Welcome yeah. back, everybody, I suppose, <laughs> to what's going to be the JP and Aaron show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is going to be, I'm going to make, it's going to be great. I'm going to make our own stuff. So uh, we literally just got on here. Mm. And before I hit record, my man said he was living the dream. And I said, I love the meme that says, you know, anybody that says, hey, I'm living the dream. No, they are not. That person is that person is not living the dream. <laughs> they're, they're having, <laughs> they're, they're, they're having they're a bad not, day. But it reminds me of a formative story of mine. And I feel like it's a good place to open this weird thing. We don't even have a plan. I wrote down some questions. Right. We're going to talk. You're, you're on an episode that's coming out here. We released a bunch of TACP mm -hmm. stuff. I don't know why. But we had a lot of uh, a lot of people like TACP. <laughs> yeah. TACP is a uh, TACP is so hot right now. Yeah, so uh, we had a we had a lot of TACP requests that that came up. But um, yeah. So back uh, it was uh it was in the winter and it was in December, uh, and we were down. I used to take this trip to from Ohio to Key West every single mm -hmm. year. My friend Chaz, shout out my boy. I still play fantasy football with him. We're seeing a Browns game after Thanksgiving. I'm sorry. Short story. We're we're down in Key West. I'm 19 or 20 years old, and we're we're going out and we're getting ready to rage. Not that I would ever engage in underage drinking. Right. Never. Yeah, of course not. But, but, so we're getting ready. We're going out. And uh, we walk past a homeless guy in Key West. And my friend Chaz, who's a very amicable dude, he's just like, oh, hey, man, how are you doing? And the guy, and the guy looks at Chaz and he's like, you know, it's another day in paradise. <laughs> and we were so taken aback by that. We were so, uh, it was just such a weird thing. Yeah. Like, you know, to have that, like, that dose of life, that dose of maturity, yeah. like this guy. Man, he's out there. He's homeless. He's living a rough life, but it's in Key West. Yeah, it's seventy-two degrees every single year, and we're worse. getting ready to go out and yeah, have dinner. And we're like, "How are you doing, my friend?" He's like, "You know, another day in paradise." I will always. <laughs> we talk about that often. That's kind of like living the dream. Yeah. Right? So, man, Justin, let's let's hear a little bit about you first. So, Justin Perrin, mm -hmm. you you came on. I hope I pronounced your last yep. name correctly. Yeah. I don't not. Oh, You're, it's the rare. first it time ever. It doesn't I, happen, but yeah, you got it right. That's good. Do they call you Piran? I get Piran a lot, a lot. Uh, or they just, <laughs> they just don't even try. They'll just be like, pair, per, per, yeah, pear, you, pear. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
probably not going to try to pronounce your last name. Yeah. Um, so, man, JP, tell us tell us who you are. Like, uh, again, the people are going to know who you are by the time this comes out. You're not supposed to on podcasts that you record. You're not supposed to, like, mention the date and time mm. so that people are like, oh, this is recorded X amount of time ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we're absolute idiots on this podcast, so <laughs> no big deal. But uh, you're you're coming out like you're part of the leadership of the TAC P FTU, and you came on. And the the genesis of this is we had such a good time. You were like, dude, I got to get back on there. We got to have a couple beers. Yeah. So it's in the off time. I am I'm having a responsible adult beverage mm-hmm. myself this evening. But um, <laughs> man, we brought you on and and we gave you the invite to come back, yeah. and and here you are. So. For, for those that missed it the first time, tell us about you. Tell us about uh, your experience. So you want the long version then? Is what you're, you're getting at, Man, sure. let's just medium let's version. just see where it goes. Yeah. Version, yeah. No, give the medium uh, version, and we'll see how long it goes. Yeah. So um, I enlisted right out of high school. Joined at 18 in uh, 2007. Um, so I've been in a little bit over 15 years now. Um, Tack P through and through. Uh, to be fair. I uh, grew up real rough and I had a pool in my backyard. So it was a miserable childhood. <laughs> and uh, I remember, I remember like, I wasn't sure. I didn't really know like tag P, CCT, all that kind of thing. But I kind of, you know, I, I had an idea. And I was like, well, let me give this a try. I swam for like 30 seconds. I was like, tag P, right? And so. Uh, <laughs> your villain yeah, origin story yeah, started like, in no, your man, pool. I know where this is going. All right. So I went right in okay. uh, tag P. Um, you know, basic training and tech P at that time, there was no FTU. You just did tech school. You went to your unit. So I went to Washington, uh, Fort Lewis where you're at right now. Uh, now J B L M at the yep. time, uh, Fort Lewis. Of course. Yeah. Back when it was hard. It was Fort Lewis. Back and, when it was hard. <laughs> um, and so when I got to Fort Lewis, um, I spent about a year just doing airman stuff. Uh, and then I, I kind of like ended up on, on the cycle. And so, uh, I did six on six off deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan um, I deployed in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. Um, I got home in 2013. Um, and then 2014, I went to weapon school instead of uh, another deployment. Um, okay. Went to weapon school. Uh, Peaches was an instructor uh, while I was there. Um, came back. We were there at the same time, by the way. Okay. When did when did you go? Uh, weapon school or Nellis? Or, um, no. Or well, yeah. Weapon school. The first time. I was in class 14 alpha. So January to... June of uh, 2014. Yeah, same time. Okay. So, yeah, we were at Nellis at the same time. So, Peaches and I, uh, he was an instructor over at WIC, mm-hmm. and then I was a troop chief over the 58. Oh, okay. So, yeah, 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 it's it's crazy how closely we, we all intersect. All right. So, yeah. weapon school, you got out of there. Did you get a call sign? Are you a patch with a call sign? We all are, of course. You have to. You have to have a call sign. Yeah, yeah. I, I, what is it? I alluded to that. Uh, my call sign's Arrow. It's just short for Arrogant. Uh, it's, it doesn't have, <laughs> there's no, uh, uh cra- well, there are backstories, but there's no one culminating event. It is just a, uh, a conglomerate of experiences and everybody was like, yeah, this is what you're going to be. Um, okay. So I went okay. to Rick and I went back to my unit at Fort Lewis and I was there for, I guess about nine months or so. I don't really know. Um, whatever the math works out to. And then I, I left there to go back to Nelson to be an instructor. Uh, so I was WIC instructor, uh, some of the guys you've had on uh, were students of mine, or they were they were uh, instructors there as well. Ben Grazer, you guys did a uh, uh, yep. guard tag P video with him. He both yeah. uh, he was yep. there at the fifth. He's about a year year maybe behind me. Um, so he worked with me after I graduated, and then replaced me when I left. And then he came to WIC, and we were instructors together. Um, so go way back with guys like that. Same with Stags, uh, Nasty, um, Roomba. Oh yeah, Roomba was now Stags. Yeah. Um, I loved it when you mentioned Stags. He and I went through Jumpmaster together. Oh, okay. I've never met so a guy I had to go... that likes static line jumping as much as he does. Like, Dude, he loves it's, it. It's weird. It's a problem. And, and the fact that he's he needs to be 745 feet tall right? like... and just likes the static line, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was funny. We met at uh, Jumpmaster School. Mm-hmm. So we had to go back. We went through the FTU school. Yep. Uh, fun story. I was a rescue Jumpmaster my entire career when i got to st they were like hey you're gonna have to go back through the jump masters yeah i was like yeah no problem yeah i I get it um but um here's the deal i'm i'm like i'm not gonna actually be the jump master for this unit (laughs) like i'm the troop chief right like i'm gonna have other people that are so if you just want to like like i don't have to do that thing i don't have to be on the letter of x's and uh 
one of the decision makers at the time points to a board and on the board, it says senior PJ will go to static line jump master and free fall jump master. And I was like, yeah, but they, they don't mean like yeah, they don't mean. senior yeah, PJ. Yeah. They mean like the senior PJ and five level upgrade yeah. that's ready to go. And the, the guy was like, well, I mean, it says senior PJ and, <laughs> and I was just you, like, oh, so that, man. so I found my way to static line yeah. JM at Fort Benning, Georgia. And then I met stags mm. at the free fall JM course. Yeah. Uh, there, but it was funny because I, I hadn't put two and two together. Mm. Peaches talks to nasty, gets him on the podcast. And he was like, Oh yeah, he's a attack P guy. His name's, you know, stack. And I was like, you mean nasty? And he's like, how do you know nasty? I was like, <laughs> I don't know. I got a couple of videos yeah. of me and him and jump me, you know, whatever. Um, okay. So how, how is that? Like, this is something that people have asked me before. Mm. I'd like to hear your take mm. on it. Uh, how is it working with people that used to be your students? Because now they're yeah. colleagues and peers. You know, what's interesting is in the, from the WIC standpoint, it's it's fine um, because it's an adult course sure. for adults, so everyone understands that dynamic. Where it's actually different is at the pipeline level, and uh, this may, I maybe should have brought this up last time I was on, but um, I, I'm going to tell you a story about me. So I went to tech school. Let's go. I graduated tech school. I go to, go to the Fort Lewis, and um, my first appointment is is normal or whatever, whatever, right? But then the guys that were instructors when I was a student are now rotating out of instructor duty and they start coming out to the units, right? So my second, third, and fourth deployments were all with guys who were instructors when I was a tech school student. And so th wow. that's something I, you know, I tell the cadre guys um, here on Nellis is like, hey, man, like you're not just training trainees. Like there's a very high likelihood you're going to see these guys again. Like these are going to be your airmen. These are going to be your your battle buddy in the in whatever next the next war is like. Uh, you're you're going to see these people again, and it also goes to on the student side like you're going to see your instructors again, and you know they'll be normal people the second time you see them. But uh, this is like <laughs> you just said it like this is a small world like paths yeah. will be crossed. You're going to see these people again, uh, and so. The only way you just have to be an adult about it, right? Like everybody's there doing a job. I mean, your instructors were mean to you because they were instructors, and now they're NCOs. Your airmen, your teammates, and you're gonna you're gonna go do the thing. But the WIC side is not not so uh, big of a deal because um, a lot of times too, it's like you know, Nasty came through as a student when I was an instructor, but Nasty's been in like twice as long as I have, so it's like. Sure. Hey, big Sarge, you didn't quite do this right, but you know it's okay. You can do it the way you you want to do, right? Like, who am I to tell you that you did it wrong? But uh... well, it's such a weird thing too, and I saw it from almost the exact opposite side. Is I would always tell the students, "Hey, you're getting out of here. I'm not just putting my stamp on you. Like, I'm no kidding. Like, when you graduate this course and when you go out to the teams." Mm -hmm. I'm sort of co-signing on yeah, you yeah. When, when you like, because, because I'll tell you what, I get the text messages. If you yeah. go to your teams and you were a dirt bag yeah, they blame and you, you were not, <laughs> the, Oh, 100%. Yeah. Those text messages blow my phone and be like, what are you doing yeah. down there? You, what are you sending me yeah. right now, dude? Um, and it's such a weird thing that when you put that level of reality on it, it helps to the pipeline gets lionized and the training gets, mm -hmm you know, hero eyes and it's sort of weird. Right. But when you put it into real terms, like, Hey, here's the deal. I have friends that are deploying like all these things mm -hmm. that you're posting about on Instagram, like, Oh, we're going to go do the nation's work. Listen, that's all true. But my friends are in their pre-deployment right now and they're going to get you on their team. Mm -hmm. You're going to go do this. And it's my friends that I care about. Yep. So I, that's how much I care about giving you what you need mm -hmm. to actually go succeed. Yeah, there's that. And there's there's the reputation of the career field to to some extent too. Like if if you're attack P and you go and you go look like a moron in front of the army, because here's what happens, right? Like you're a young airman and then you go make an ass of yourself in front of a lieutenant. In ten years, that army lieutenant's not a platoon leader anymore. He's a battalion commander, and now he hates and he's a colonel and he hates and now and now he and he doesn't want especially hates air force. Yeah, and and so like it it matters. It's very important that. You know, right foot forward and all that kind of stuff. So it's definitely difficult, especially here. I mean, we kick guys out three days before they're supposed to be like graduating and done, and it sucks. It's <sighs> it is absolutely miserable. There's nobody that enjoys doing that. Um, <sighs> but it's like, man, you just you can't. Either I'm I'm you're gonna hurt somebody, or you're you're gonna just you're gonna ruin this for the rest of us. Is kind of you know. Dude, and I've, yep, and I've seen it from both sides as well. I was on a team where we had people that got kicked out, like literally right before graduation. 
And, and of course, from the student angle, you're like, oh, I can't believe these cadre and mm. this is nonsense. And I, I won't deny that sometimes there have been like, you know, cadre haven't done the right thing. Mm. Like there's been erroneous kickouts. Yep. There's also been people that graduated, though, that should have never graduated. Right. right? And I've seen it from both sides. The director of training um, at Kirtland has a lot of authority for who gets to stay in the course. Mm -hmm. I occupied that position. So, of course, I had to see people out of the course. Yeah. Man, it is the absolute worst mm -hmm. because you really are trying to do your level best to maintain those moral and ethical guidelines yeah. and give everybody a fair shot. But sometimes people just don't make the standard yeah. and it sucks. It it effing sucks to have to just be like, all right, listen, yeah. The the worst for me was when I, I really liked the student. Yeah. Because you can't help yeah. but have your horse, man. Yeah, every yeah, time yeah. every every instructor has you're like, I love this dude. I want him to figure it out. Yeah. I want this mm -hmm. student to figure it out. No matter how objective you think you are, sometimes it's just there's there's a vibrational energy between you. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Get get too yeah. get too like a uh, hippie on it. Yeah. Um but man, you're just like, man, I want you to figure out. And sometimes they don't. And I don't want to like, I don't want to use emotional language. Right. But it almost breaks your heart. You're yeah, just like, you're right. dang it. I, I just wish you would figure it out. Yep. And I think that's, you know, a hundred percent agreed. And I've had those experiences both with the, the pipeline and, and Wick and, you know, especially, especially a Wick, like, cause the guys that go there are, these are your champions, right? This is, these, this is my yeah. guy. And they just, you know, they just don't, the, the ones that are hard is when they just don't get it, but they're awesome dudes. Damn it. And they just, you're just like, come on, right. man. Like just figure this out. Oh, good this dude. Out, you know? Good um, dude. Give you the shirt off his yeah, back. Absolutely. Like I, there's two guys I'm, I have in mind and, and just, I mean, they're the greatest human beings you've ever met and, but they just, they just can't quite get it. You're like, I yeah. can't, I think like, we can't put this patch on your shoulder or we can't give you this beret or we can't like, you just not getting it. And I think that's why like things like assessments are so important. Um, and, and identifying certain things. I, I, I've said this a lot about like being a JTAC and there may be similar things, uh, in medicine or, or, or being a PJ or whatever there's to me, I think, I don't know if spatial awareness is, is the correct term. Cause I'm not like a doctor. Um, but <laughs> okay. you know, you're, you're looking at a, like a paper map or a, a, a 2d phone an imagery kind of thing. And you're hearing voices in both ears. And like, if you can't turn that into a, a mental image of, of what is going on, you're not going to be a good JTAC. Uh, you could potentially be like, wow, not capable of being one at all. And I, you know, I actually was talking to students today and I was like, look, man, I can't dunk a basketball or whistle. Some people just can't do this job. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're a good person or, or, you know, a great American or whatever else. It's just like, there is a certain, uh, talent uh, visualization, spatial awareness, whatever you want to call it. There, there are some innate things that you have to have. And I think we could save everybody a lot of time and heartache with, um, assessments and selections and things like that. Nothing to do with how many pushups you can do just straight up. Like, Nothing. do you have, yep. do you have the gene that lets you picture a 3d image of, of what's going on? Um, cause if you don't, you're not going to do it. You just can't. And, and just like I can't dunk or, or play in the NFL, like you can't be a JTAC and that's, it sucks when the guy that you're talking to that or telling that to is like an awesome dude. And you're like, Hey man, we're going to kick you out of the course, but we can go get a beer if you want. Like, it's, like right now, you ready? Like, let's leave. But right. Uh, yeah, it, it definitely sucks. Oh, it's the worst. Well, and man, I, you, you phrase it so perfectly. I, it, it's, it's the putting it together. Right. And I, I totally agree that, there is a certain time. And I, we've talked about it so much about, is it, is, are these traits, are they born in you or can you train them? I think you just so accurately described that line of what you can't train. I can train you all the time. Mm -hmm. I can train you in all these individual tasks, but even from the PJ side of it. So, and you like that visual representation of a battle space for you, mm -hmm. that, that building of a picture, it's a total tangent mm -hmm. that's going to lead into the the, yeah, fine, yeah, yeah. the finality of the story but um my do and i have the distinct capability to sit in our offices and we can tune out everything that's going on out in the ops room there's like 25 people mm -hmm. that sit right outside of our door but we'll like laugh at something we'll come out we'll engage in the conversation one of the one of the um med techs uh that was working in ops she was like you guys are so funny you guys all day long, you're just in there typing away and then you'll, you'll pay attention to 10 different things at a time and you'll walk out here and you'll just laugh. You'll engage in a conversation. You hear everything 
And then you don't get mad at us for when we're talking about complete nothing. We're like, yeah, we tune you out. Right. Dude, I don't know how to describe that trait. Mm. For JTAX, it's completing a picture of an environment mm. from multiple different sources and being able to figure out for us, man, I'm thinking about how to fix a human to get them to stop dying and then correctly communicate what I need. Right. For sometimes a really complex scenario, like somebody could be dying and they could be trapped and I could need a complex rope system. And I have to be able to communicate that mm. as fast as I can to my friends because we have a thing like those that trait, whatever that is, mm. if, if you want to call it spatial awareness, I love spatial awareness. I love, um, you know, being able to understand operational momentum, being able to understand where you are in time and space. I don't we need to come up with a name for that attribute mm. and we need to find a way to test it. But I'll tell you what, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. When you see a student put that together, that's how you know you're like, you got it. Mm -hmm. Like you can do all of these things. You're seeing these things. I don't know what it is, but I know when I recognize right. it. I know when my students at the, at the apprentice course, when I saw them be able to stop a bleed and tell somebody else to help them in a certain way and then communicate to their team leader and be like, hey, listen, it might not be perfect, but you can, you can see it. Yeah. You can see it when somebody finally gets mm -hmm. it and it feels so good. Yeah. We started talking about, you know, how it feels bad when you see somebody that, that can't reflect what you need. That's, I, I don't know that, that trait is so important. Yeah. It's uh, maybe I'm airing dirty laundry, but you know, I, I don't, if I'm in, if I'm in the sim with you, it's, it's not good, right? I'm only in there because you're <laughs> failing. And uh, if I'm in, it's cause I'm taking the trash out. I don't <laughs> yeah, even belong yeah, in that room. Yeah, yeah. I, I go into that room. I like walked around it once and I was like, Oh, it's really dark in here. I'm going to get out. Uh, you guys don't need me. Yeah. The, uh, you know, the line instructors, they got, they don't need me. Right. If I'm in there, it's cause you're, you're on your way out of the course. Right. And so uh, yeah. the first many Sims and students that I saw were struggling. Um, and I started wondering like, is this too hard? Like, is this, are yeah. we, are we asking too much of these guys? And then, uh, then I was like, you know what? I need to see someone who's, who's good. Right. And so, so I went back and scheduled an office. I'm like, Hey, who, who's crushing this course? And they're like, Oh, this guy. I'm like, I'm going to go watch his next sim. And I went in there and I'm not kidding. Seven minutes in the sim. I'm like, I've seen enough. I'm done. He gets it. And I like, I don't need to watch the rest of it. Like this wow, guy what good feedback. gets it. We're done. Versus spending an hour of, of, or well, several hours, maybe even days of like very emotional, not, not very emotional. That's the wrong word, but it, it hurts. You care. You're, you're trying to figure out like, how yeah. do I save this guy? How, like, he's a good dude. Does, does he just need more time? Some guys just need more time. Some guys don't yep. get it and they're never going to get it. And it's, it's yep. evident. Right. And so it, it, that was actually a really eye opening experience for me was to see somebody who did get it um, at the mm -hmm. level that, you know, like the FTU students are. It's like, all right, who's the best dude in this class? Let me go watch him. And literally, I mean, I he starts talking, and you're like, yeah, he gets it. It was like the voice or those, sh those singing shows, you know, they sing like one note, and all the judges are like, yep, that guy. <laughs> oh, they... <laughs> you can tell. You can tell like that. It, it is that easy. Hey, what's up, y'all? Small tip technical difficulties as always it was my fault we were talking about those guys that just don't get it man like and and you want them they're a, they're a good dude you can see the raw material you see that they're you see that they're just right there and you got to give them that counseling what would you say to those people because a lot of our a lot of our listeners have that in the back of their mind they're like all right well if i'm not going to make it these guys are just gonna say f off and get out of here man how how do you go about motivating those people that are just right there that have to work on a, a thing or two here or there like what does that conversation sound like to you honesty is always the best the best way to go uh, hey listen man you're not making it you, you know you have you have failed the course you are being removed from training you are going to be cross training a different career field um that doesn't make you a bad person that doesn't make you a, a lesser man yeah like kind of like i said before i can't whistle there's things that people just can't do uh and you're you're right you're not getting this and i can't turn you loose because you're gonna kill people i, I wouldn't tell somebody like hey you're gonna kill somebody but that is the consequences of not doing this correctly there there was a lot of fratricide over the course of 20 years in in the gwat like i'm too much I am right not, i'm not yep. gonna let you be that guy and that's the worst case scenario. Um, but 
the other part of that reality is like you are still in the Air Force. You still sign that contract. Like you're you're going to be retrained. And dep- honestly, and this, you know, if I if I were to give advice, um, you shouldn't be thinking about failure and all that other kind of stuff. But this is where that like good dutership comes into play because we can right. try oh, to yeah. vector you into something that you may actually want to do if you're a good guy right. that just, you know, you don't have the gene, you can't make 3d pictures in your head and it just isn't going to work, but you're a good guy. And maybe you're interested in Intel or maybe you, you are interested in being um, like a sensor operator or something like that. Like maybe we can, maybe we can do that. Um, yep. If you're not a good dude, um, you're going to go wash jets. Like, and I, you know, I'm not going to feel bad about it either. So um, I, w- I would say, right. Not that you should be planning to fail and all that kind of stuff, but I completely understand. My brothers were in the Navy, but I wasn't going to try being a SEAL because if you fail out of SEAL school, you go wash boats for four years. Like, I'm not going to do that, right? So I get it. Like, people are able to put some critical thought into this. So it's not a bad thing. Uh Um, But obviously, you can't be thinking about it. But so being a good dude will uh, mitigate the effects of failing. However, if you know, if that does happen to you and, and it's like, look, man, this isn't for you. Um, you're, I mean, we're definitely not going to send you off to be like a PJ or something like you're, you're going to the, the big air force, but there's still cool stuff right. that you can be doing. And you're not, you know, if, like I said, if you're, you just lack the, the gene that gives you such situ- situational, uh, God damn it. Uh, spatial awareness, like <laughs> this fine. I love you know, it. There's stuff that you, there's cool yeah. stuff that you can go do and, and we'll work with you. On Dude, I stuff. live that job. Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I, I got that job. I, I am the guy that you're talking about. I just could not put it together. My first time at Indoc, I failed miserably. I've told the story a million yeah. times. I was a failure, and then I got out. I had to do a different job. Yeah. Um, but but that job, I have lifelong friends from that mm-hmm. job. That job was great for me. That was a great Air Force job. That was not aspect war. It was in the in, in the med group of all yeah. places. Fiztech uh, fell under the med group mm-hmm. and. It luckily that provided me the path back. Yeah. I mean, at like, the end I of the day, being you're a still tech. in the Air Force, which you know, yeah. kind of sucks. In like, you're still you're still going to pay Uncle Sam, but it's also kind of awesome. You're in the Air Force. Come on, it's a great fucking career. Like you've got, <laughs> like you are set up, man. Like you have a successful yeah. future in front of you. Like, um, yeah. Well, that and you got in to serve, right? Like you, okay, you may have, you. Like if that's not your baseline, and I will say this, I'm very. Um, there are very few things like for for those of you that aren't tracking, it's a it's an insult to say that you're big blue, mm-hmm. right? In ST, oh, you're blued up, you're you're big blue, whatever. People will say you get reblued when you go back to your PME. It's just a thing inside of our culture, you know. You you go, we we do spend time on the other side of the fence, and it's not elitist. Mm-hmm. Um, it is elite. Like we do things that are different. We are given special equipment. Mm-hmm. We're given a bigger budget. We're given special attention. Th- those things are all true, mm-hmm. right? Um, we don't cross paths with regular Air Force people a whole lot, right? Like it just is what it is. We just have a different mission set. And so they like, I also don't talk to fighter pilots a whole right. lot. They have a completely, completely different, different mission set. And this, <laughs> especially for me, at least the JTAX talk to them on the phone here and there. Like, they get on a net yeah. with them somewhere. And they're, they're, they're like, it's oh. different. It's just different. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my life. Man. It is different. Right. Right. But we don't have a whole lot of interaction with them either. So when you go back to these things and you get yourself, you know, re blued, um, there's value in that. When I, when I went back to the regular Air Force, there's still a way to serve. If your baseline goal here is not i want to serve my country and i want to do that by going into aspect war you should all if you don't make aspect war you should always be able to get back to your floor the people that i worry about are the people that are like aspect war or yeah. nothing so i get the whole hey till valhalla brother <laughs> you come back from selection <laughs> on your shield or with it bro yeah. like man get out of here yeah i, yeah, I yeah. was i was in i was i did yeah. that like I was a guy that when I was training, I was like, I have to, I'm going to go or I'm going to die trying. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Can you temper that with a little bit of why are you actually mm-hmm. doing this? Do you want to serve? Do you want to serve in the air force? The most unhappy unpa- people I see are the people that haven't done exactly what you just mm-hmm. said. Like, Hey, okay, well, what happens if this doesn't work out? What happens if I, you know, do I, do I want to serve? Mm-hmm. Where do I want to serve? We get so many questions about, Oh, well, what branch should I go into? I don't know. Yeah. 
what do you want to yeah. do? Like, do you realize if you don't, if you want to go be a seal, cool, but you have no desire to be in the big boat Navy, if you don't be a seal. Yeah. Well, now we, we got a problem. Right. Cause even if you, even the if seal- you make a seal or you become a PJ or you become any of these aspect wars, like you are still in that service. And this is a constant problem that we have. Like if you do more than four years, Man. you're going to have to go be an airman in the air force. Like, and it doesn't, you know, <laughs> look, I'm not saying you're going to have to go do like work at the, you know, the admin section or whatever, but like, you are right. in the Air Force. You're going to have to write performance reports. You're going to have to learn how to supervise airmen. You're going to have to go to... You're going to have to do CBTs. Yeah, like, you're going to have to... You dude. are still in the Air Force. At the end of the day, no matter what, you're still an airman. Uh, so, it, you know, so, like you said, like it's you got to be ready for... Even if, even if you make it, you didn't make it. Right. My favorite uh, way to illustrate this point is I worked with... They were formerly called CAG. They're now called something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, a sergeant major that was an instructor that actually an honorary PJ. We went through the entire process and there is a process to make somebody an honorary PJ, right. but um, D uh, I won't put them out there. Right. Shadow mountain group. Go look them up. D is awesome. D is an honorary PJ. And he used to joke. He'd be like, yeah, man, he's got this very distinctive way of mm-hmm. talking. So everybody that knows D is <laughs> like all 10 people listening to this yeah, podcast right, right. is going to recognize my <laughs> D impression. And then everybody else is going to be like, why is Aaron talking like that? He'd be like, yeah, man, listen, you can be the coolest guy in the world up there on the hill wearing civilian clothes every day. But guess what? You're still in the army, bro. You still got to do CBTs. Yeah. You still have stand downs for things. Like, that's where you have to start. You have to be like, what's the basic why? I, I have a very distinct why. My why that I've said as a PJ is I love cheating death. People that are supposed to die, I love being like, nope. F you, not yeah. today. This one today, not today. Uh, I And I also love on the other side of it doing like, you know, we have a remarkable track record of getting away with hilarious hijinks <laughs> and death defying <laughs> antics all the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? I love cheating death. It's amazing. But my why initially came from my willingness to serve. Like I want to be in the military. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what when I started out. But I knew I wanted to be in something. 2001 uh, happened. And I was like, all right, yeah, I, I, I need to. This is this is my generation's mm-hmm. call. You can't be the greatest generation without going and doing stuff, right? right? Well, 2001 was that opportunity for me to go do mm-hmm. stuff. And I knew I wanted to serve. And that was my why. I'm not putting myself out there to be the example. But what I'm saying is the thing that I see that I don't reflect in some of these younger cats and dogs that are getting in right now is my baseline. Why was like, I want to serve. Mm. And then if I get to do all these other cool things, tight, best case scenario, yeah. you have people now that are like, well, I don't want to come in because if I don't make CCT or if I don't make TAC people, then I don't want to serve. We're like, well, yeah, here's some real talk. Yeah, we don't, we don't want you. Yeah. No. Like, because those are, those are the guys that, you know, the second they, they, let's say you make it, but you still have that attitude. The second they start getting hit with all the other stuff that everyone has to do, they, they get out and there's, look, there's nothing wrong with doing one contract and getting out. I'm not, I'm not, you know, disparaging that. Nope. But you, you right. know what I'm talking about. Like the second they're asked to do anything other than, you know, jump and shoot guns, they're just like, nah, I'm not doing that. And they're out. And then there's the same guys that will complain about like, well, why can't I make E7? So you you know why you can't make these seven right like this <laughs> you have to do well and, and that's that's leading to our problems with recruitment and retention now is those mid grade dudes those first assignment maybe second assignment dudes are like oh man this is over GWAT's over I'm out I don't want to do this you're not giving me the school that I want you're not giving me the assignment that I yeah. want the mission set's not there I'm out of here yeah. that's the biggest problem that I have with those cats right. is they're like oh well everything's changed so much I want to get out. Okay, so your willingness to get what you want isn't more than your service. Right. Like you, you don't want to do these things. Like, man, and there's certainly like you, look, f- you can you can do your your time and leave and, and serve honorably, and and the nation owes you a debt, and and everybody can respect those kind of things. But it kind of goes back to what, you know. I'm assuming this video comes out after the first one we did, and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. the G one is is over. Essentially, right? Like for all intents and purposes, yep. it, it, it's over. We're on to the next thing. No, it's over. And we yeah. don't know what that next thing is. So no, you're not going to do six on, six off, mowing the grass in Afghanistan. But you might be invading the next country on a horse. You might be riding <laughs> freaking M1 Abrams through Ramadi. I don't know. Nobody knows what's next. 
You know who gets it on? The people in the invasion. So, yes, you are kind of... Yo. Nobody knows. Yeah, you know who does get it on? The people that are there when it starts. You're exactly right. You know know who got it on in 1993? We just had the the, uh, anniversary of Black Hawk Down. Man, there was no war going on. I don't know if you guys know that, but it's a derogatory term that we use. It's a 90s operator because there was nothing going on. Well, uh, except for... There's a little geographically yeah. separated unit that we know about that lives out in the Tar Heel mm-hmm. state. And those dudes didn't weren't Did training for stuff. urban combat yeah. either. Yeah. Right. You you know, you got you got heroes like and even the army tier one unit. Man, were they were they training for what they went into there? Yeah. No. A- absolutely not. They had no Only idea that it was coming. I don't know what they were training for, but but yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I can I tell you this: I know the Ranger Regiment had high and tights and hundred pound rucks and was carrying fucking construction ladders everywhere they went. Like things change. Yep. Like you're yes, G G walks yeah. over, but nobody knows what's going to happen. You you served twenty years in the military in a, in a job that uh, people watching this podcast would be joining. Like something's going to happen. I, I don't know what. It might be another twenty year war. It might be a, a, a single uh, event. It might be a three day operation. I don't know, but stuff's going to happen and right. you got to be ready for that. Or you might fail out and, and go get into Intel or, or sensor operator, or maybe you go into maintenance and, and you get all these amazing certifications or cyber, all these other kind of things. Like there, there is a life outside of doing this, arguably a better life outside of doing a lot of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can get away with all that nasty dying yeah. that we always get threatened with yeah. all the time. It's, that's a uh, Trent and I always laugh about the, well, what do you guys do every day? Well, I don't know. I'm going to go jump free fall like four times on, on Tuesday morning. And then I'm going to get back to the office as soon as I can to answer emails. Yeah. And even while I'm like doing free falls, I'm probably going to have my work phone on me answering yeah. emails. There is, there is no way like, look at that range answering emails on a phone, skydiving right. with some of my closest friends where I could, I could die. And that's a regular Tuesday. Right. That's just, that's just Tuesday, you know, like you're going to get used to things and you're going to be sensitized to things in these career fields that are going to go above and beyond. And by the way, you know, I lean on my inside. It's funny that you keep mentioning Intel. That's um, I, I think that's it's because they're I so important. If I, if I couldn't do this, I would probably go on Intel. But. Dude, those guys, I, man, I make no bones about it. We're in the business of war fighting. We're here. To, we're here to kill people. Mm-hmm. Like if you're not in the business of war fighting, you're not in, you're not here to kill people. That others may live. No, that's tight and everything. Uh, that's self sacrificial. Number one and number two, it comes with the understanding that I'll kill you if you get in, in between who I'm trying mm-hmm. to get. Right? Like that. That's what we're here yeah. to do. Like we're not non combatants. We are, we are here to do the business of war fighting. In this, you can make it sound special with calling it the profession of arms, mm-hmm. and you can say that we are professional war fighters. In the end, there is somebody on the business end of that mm-hmm. rifle. And it's usually not us. Yeah, hopefully you know what I mean. Is. Like you have to, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You don't want you don't want to get the. Uh, I I love going to ta- this is another tangent. I love going to tactical shooting yeah. schools just because the instructors come up with very funny ways <laughs> to say very mundane things. Like we had a guy the that he was like, "Hey man, I'm going to okay, hit you." All right. <laughs> it's like you just say his head. No. We had an instructor to, sh- yeah, <laughs> exactly. We uh, we had an instructor at a shooting school. It was like, I'm going to hit you with the most cliches I can talking about CQC. And we're like, here we go. He's like, hey, man, listen up. If you break that door and you got your booger switch and it's not on pew pew, you clear that corner. Somebody's going to give you the bad news, man. That bad news is full of the flags. We're canceling Christmas, dog. You're like, wow. Can you can we get a salt life till Valhalla brother in there? Don't run across that room. You'll just be rushing to your death, my guy. You're going to have to trust me. 2,900 feet per second works just as well from the door as it is exposed inside the room, my dude. Go ahead and stitch him up. And you're like, that's a bumper (laughs) sticker, my guy. Size 12 font. It is. That whole everything you just said. (laughs) (laughs) Just on a shirt. Man, the three dogs are going to love this. The brothers, brothers. they're out here. The brother, what's that? A sixty round mag? Yeah. What's I used to live brother? in Southern Pines. I know about the brothers. Like it's, <laughs> you know about the brothers. It's it's B and it's got a weird thing yeah. over the R the and then two dots, the U, yeah. <laughs> two dots over the U. Two dots over the U. Um, 
I don't even remember what we started on before I took us on this tangent. I don't either. (laughs) Okay. We're we're just going to have to move on with it. I just started laughing and giggling about things and then forgot. I I, I think in general, we were just talking about, you know, the GWAT game is over. Like service is important, Mm -hmm. right? Like if if your baseline isn't, I want to get in and I want to serve and I want to do these Mm -hmm. things. Man, that shouldn't be that shouldn't be your goal, right? And uh, then we started. Now we're there. So now we were talking about Intel, um, but but I will tell you, like, there is a, a, another way to serve. There there is no more people, and this is I finally figured out how we got all the way back there. <laughs> and and it's we we kill people and we uh, yep. yeah 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 okay I'm back on track conduct the business it. of war fighting. There we go, got it. Um, but make no mistake. Uh, I don't know if anybody, I don't know if anybody has made more of a national level impact than your Intel shop, your A2, your S2, your J2, because where do those targeting packages come from? Intel. Where does the threat reporting come from? Intel. Where do you, before you get a mission and you want to hear from one person, who's that person? Intel. It ain't weather. It ain't anybody (laughs) else. Intel drives it ain't the weather, right? It's like doctrine. Intel blow. drives the operation, right? They're like, hey, listen, we're going to be here. It, you know, to quote Zero, Zero Dark Thirty was an Intel uh, porn film. <laughs> That's what that was. Zero, Zero Dark Thirty was Jessica Chastain, who is gorgeous. <laughs> Shout out redheads. Jessica Chastain telling people that she was sure that Osama bin Laden was at a place and they were right. And then they got to go kill somebody yep. that hurt America. Like, I will never poo poo Intel. Those folks, I go to, if I have a serious problem, I go to A2. Yeah. Like those are my cats, you know? Uh, and the fact that if that's your baseline, if, if that's where you want to live, if you want to just say, I want to serve and I want to get after America's enemies, man, Intel, whoo, yeah. get it. It's, I mean, they work harder than anybody. Um, 100%. And it's all the thing. 100%. Right? Like you, you make you meaningful impacts, opens all the doors. I mean, the things that those guys can get into are, are insane. Um, you, yeah. you, you can yeah. kind of control your own destiny. I mean, yeah, you're, you know, your first assignment, you'll probably go to like the fire squatter and you'll just be like, this is an SA6. But your career is, is whatever you want it to be after that. And um, yeah. yeah, no, that was always my, uh, well, it, was, it wasn't always, I didn't have a backup plan. But now in hindsight, <laughs> I was gonna if ask. I, I was gonna ask. Goes. Oh, is this yeah, your backup yeah, plan? Yeah. I love that you admitted know, that you're just like, no, I hadn't. Yeah. <laughs> I already, I already knew I ain't a swimmer, so like I was already being a realist about, <laughs> about what was going on. <laughs> so, man, let's get some real talk out of the way. Is it is it funner to say that it was hard when I went through, or is it actually true? Like, was it easier back when we went through? I don't know about PJ. I, you know, I had never even bothered with that. Uh, but um, <laughs> who would? Who would really? If 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 taxi was harder back in the day, it was just out of like stupidity. It was just out of ignorance. And thank it's you. Just like, oh, okay, maybe maybe we got smoked a little bit worse. But that's just because they didn't know what else to do. Like it's just oh, this right. is, this is how you prove you're a man. You do push ups till someone ends up in the hospital. Like that's not how you train people. It's not how you make professionals. It's, it, it's just not correct. Was it, was it physically harder? I don't know. Maybe compare that to now where they're, you know, they're working out with like guys that were in the NFL or guys that have uh, master's deg- multiple master's degrees in human performance. Multiple, and, like multiple. It, it, are they, are they treated like adults more than I was? Yes. Are they being trained better than I was? Also, yes, very much so. Like, um, now your the thing you posted the other day with uh, your message about you were you were talking about the entitlement stuff and all that, and I, I think you're 100 yeah. percent spot on. Like, yes, there we do. We know that you're um, the fact that you're being treated like a human, and I wasn't. Ten percent of me like doesn't like that, but it's a dumb. It's a dumb ten percent <laughs> of me. Like at the end of the day, I just want a teammate as good as a job and does what needs to be done. And I don't have to babysit or, or right. worry about you, you know, causing problems or, or not getting the things done. Yeah. I mean, look, the first couple of months at your, at your unit after the pipeline are, are not going to be fun. Um, hazing's right. illegal and I'm not condoning that. I'm just saying like, you're, you're going to get, <laughs> you're going to get tested. Like you're going to get prodded, you know, guys yeah. want to know, they, they want to know yeah. that you're a dude that 
did the dude stuff that they did. And then that blows over. We want a shared yeah, experience. Exactly, exactly. And so we, we want to know that you went through something hard to, and we've talked about, I, I think it was uh Perilio master Sergeant Mike Perilio that we brought on. He was like, ANS is important. He, he was describing the difference. Right. And we're talking about, was it easier when I went through or was it not? But he was like the new guys that are coming through the night, new guys and girls. And it's, again, it's both sides of the coin. We want them. We want to know that the test that they passed were as yep. hard as they were for us because yep. it was, it was effing hard, yep. dude. Like it was the the biggest challenge we've ever went yep. through. They, they hate calling it a crucible. Mm -hmm. It's a crucible. Right. But from the other side of the coin too, the younger cats, they want that respect mm -hmm. and good on them. Good on them for setting that boundary for themselves to be like, listen, I went through something that was hard. Mm -hmm. I think we share that together. And I, and I think it's, a, it those, it's those two communities yep. that are like, I want you to go through something hard because we had that shared experience and, and I want to be able to, to have that validated mm -hmm. as well. No, I, I agree with you. And I think, um, I like, I don't, I think I said this last time, like the, maybe I didn't, I don't know this scenario. Like I, I'm a, I'm a WIC graduate. I was a weapon school instructor. I'm at least okay at being a JTAC. The first time I saw the sins <laughs> and the missions that these dudes are doing in the pipeline, I was like, holy crap, I'm glad I didn't have to do that. Like it, I've said it a hundred times. I've said I it a hundred, even the physical stuff. Yeah. Even the physical yeah. stuff that I said, I was like, man, I'm glad I'm a PJ yeah. now. Uh, cause Jesus Christ, the stuff that they are asking these young men and women to do. I'm, I'm like, yeah, holy crap. Now, on the other hand, I, there are, it may not be. I don't think there's as many events that suck for the purpose of sucking. I, I, I do think that there's less mm -hmm. of that. And, and maybe the debate mm -hmm. is, is how valuable events like that were. I don't really think they were mm -hmm. valuable. I don't think they matter. I think at a certain point you've and like, again, I'm an FTU guy. We still have three level. We still have tech school. You still go through the, you're a worthless right. cone phase. So like that, we're sure. done and over with that. Like we're training guys to be useful to the to the squadrons when they get out there. And um, some of the stuff that we used to do was just stupid. But like you said, it's oh, a, yeah. it was a shared stupidity that we all <laughs> that we all had. So because well, you price, would get like, done yeah. with it, and you would have that positive feedback, like you'd be cleaning up after us. I I distinctly remember cleaning up after a smoke session on Easter Sunday. And laughing with my friends, but like putting our rooms Jesus back together and just being like, oh, that was, yeah, what a, <laughs> what a bunch of silly goose behavior, you know, what about, oh, we're, we're a bunch of silly gooses out here just doing push ups on Sunday. Yeah. And the instructor was mad at us for no reason and really just came over here to, yeah. to haze us, you know, for two hours and throw our shoes in a tree. But man, you know, yeah. okay, I, I am 100% in agreement with you. I think there's less stupidity now. And I think, I think people confuse that stupidity for valuable yep. training. And they're like, well, these guys are, these guys are getting sleep and they're getting taken care of. And people are actually telling them what to do. I had a, an instructor when I was there literally told me how to stay away from being dehydrated by drinking eight ounces of water before I went to bed. And the way that you would tell if you were hydrated enough is you had to wake up in the middle of your sleep to go to the bathroom. Right. And now we know that waking up ruins your sleep and lowers your <laughs> HRV and like all these other things that like, you know, <laughs> smart people have told us, but you know, no, yeah. it's going to suck. It's going to be hard. Like yeah, we, let's, 100%. we leave people out like, with high standards, not with, not with just dumbass <laughs> tests, you know, like, right. But, so what's the uh what, what's your what's your stopping point though? So we we agree. I, I agree that doing seventy five push ups versus seventy three push ups does not make you an operator, mm -hmm. right? That, that at least for there the professional objectivity ends for me, and I think we start into the realm of per professional subjectivity. Where do you think that that hits its limit though? Because a guy can be a great mm -hmm. dude. Let's say you have the the best guy in the world, but he ends last. Mm -hmm in the rankings, yeah. right? Where does that end? What, what are those, what are the things that you need to see from somebody that you can tell is a good leader, mm -hmm. but doesn't have it together physically? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more like holistically here than, than in my specific position uh, right now, but yeah, there, and I think this is, this is what at least the air force. And I think a lot of the other uh, 
organizations try to do it. And it started with women in service and all that kind of stuff. But they went to like, let's let's use like math and science and and figure out like a mm-hmm. guy needs to be this strong and this fast and lift this much weight. And and let's be objective about it. Uh, and I, I think that is ultimately a good thing that they that they've tried to figure that out. And, you know, I actually just took our the operator fitness test a couple of days ago and it's I think they're still adjusting it. Like some of those. Have, are you a little swimmer boy? No, definitely. Are you no, swimming we, or are you we, running? We, we wave that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, that mile and a, mile I will sucks. say that mile and a half. It's terrible. Dude, you think it's going to be. But yeah. no, I'm swimming every it single time. And maybe so that's because I'm a Pete. Yeah. I'm a rescue boy. That run. Yeah. I don't know what. You know what? It's dying. because you um, two hours there, of combine stuff. There's a little, uh, there's a little magic in the mix here. And I've always maintained that the way that they structured that 300 meter shuttle mm-hmm. and the hundred meter, um, shuttle yeah. run with the yeah. kettlebells, yo, that is yeah. terrible. And trying to go into the run after those yeah. two events, that 300 meter shuttle for, for people that aren't tracking, it's the worst event. It's a 25, worst event. it's a 20, oh, dude, by yeah. far, you get two shots at it. It's a 300 meter shuttle. It's a 25 yard course, meaning you have to run down and back. So it's either, was it uh 12 lengths yeah. so 12 it's, it's, yeah down and back 25 six or times. six exactly down and back, back six times so 12 laps and you have to turn the entire time the stress that that acceleration deceleration turn acceleration deceleration causes at every single time you are smoked. You get a three minute break, and then it's the average of those two yeah. times. What uh, is it? Sixty nine seconds to max it. To max it, yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, minute nine. Dude, like it is awful. Maybe a minute. <clears throat> and then, uh, but yes, yeah, 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 I think so. It is awful. That shuttle run, worst event, and the way that they ordered the events, yeah. magnifique. Yeah, Mwah. if you're trying to make it yeah. hard, it's legitimately like not hard, and you're like, oh, this is easy, and then. It, then it stops being easy and you're like this is terrible and i want to kill myself this is the worst thing. it's it's awful it's yeah. awful it is awful so <laughs> and it and it fits right into what we're talking about but that test is in the the quote about the test it, it's easy to pass you have to be fit as shit to max yeah. it like to max that test even at the like cuz the 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 um output has changed mm-hmm. a couple times right like the max score has changed in the evolutions um, as we designed the test. Even now, you have to be super fit in order. That 510 five drill is fat. You have to be online with NFL combine players yeah. in order to max the, the 510 five yeah. drill. It's just, it's tough, but we allow for a large range, right? It's easy to pass it, it's extremely tough. To max yeah. it to get that ninety eight and just to save you in the, in the comment section, like you, you're gonna have to swim. Like <laughs> there's 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 yeah. words in there about doing the run a couple times after you uh-huh. like made it in life, uh, but also you never made it. Yeah, you're never gonna save me in the comment yeah, section. I tried, so I did, don't I you I good, you know, don't yeah. you worry about that. Um, what's your uh, what's your favorite part about being a TACB? What's your favorite part of the mission? You know, it's funny because I'm, I'm honestly like, not like some, you know, like you, I think you said like, you, you know, you love, uh, treating patients and, and the rescue pieces of it. Like I, yeah. I, I'm not like, I don't love fire support or, or close air support. Like I'm, it, it's the thing that I do. Um, the thing that I love about type P is, is the opportunity that it, that it provides. Um, because you can do any, anything. And, and what I mean by that is, um, and this is could maybe be held against the crew, but like if you just want to be like you can be a nerd in Tag P, right? Like you you can sit at a computer and, <laughs> and be a comm wizard and, mm-hmm. and and do big high level command and control type stuff, and and a lot of people enjoy that kind of thing. You can also be so cool you don't exist anymore. Like this, the spectrum is is the entire gamut, um, and sometimes that's that's a hindrance um, because you have to account for so many possibilities. Um, but it's also, it's also really cool. Like if you, you want to work with the Rangers, you can do that. You want to work with SF, you can do that. You want to disappear, you can do that. You want to play video yeah. games all day, you can do that too. Like you can, you can get into whatever it is that, that you find uh, a happiness doing. Um, some people kind of end up in roles that maybe they don't want to be in, but you can take control of your destiny and, and get into the stuff that you enjoy doing. 
Um, I can't promise you anything. I mean, I, I know guys that have been in 15, 20 years and deployed a bunch of times and killed a bunch of people and they never got to go to jump school, right? Like stuff happens. I can't promise you anything, but, but right. you can get into, you yeah. can get into to a lot. Um, and I think it's the unique part of, of our career field versus the other ones. Um, I mean, you, you can do whatever you want as a, as a tag because you just, you just have high, high demand skill sets. Like everybody needs something that you can do. Um, and you can go either, either direction with that. Well, and the rescue units are doing it right mm-hmm. now, right? Yep. Like the rescue units are, in, are ingraining tag P. How do you feel about that initiative? Well, there's different ways that they're going about it. And then, uh, you know, not to be lame, some of it we're not, you know, we can't talk about on YouTube, but, um, there's, there's the differences yeah, of fair. it. Like, do I think tag P's would be really good on a boat doing like open ocean rescues? Well, maybe not. Maybe, maybe you don't do that. Like, <laughs> that, that Let's that pump the brakes. Be the move. Um, Take it yeah. easy, my guy. But we do make it, we do make a good team. Uh, when you think about, um, yeah. staging for things, you know, when, when you, when, if you're going to go fight an air war against somebody, picture a place. Um, you need persistent Ma- communications. <laughs> Picture of place. You need persistent maybe maybe somewhere on the other people. side of the globe. Yeah, yeah. You know, maybe there's an ocean in the right. way. Yeah, yeah. Um, like <laughs> maybe there's a lot of water right. around. You, you I don't know. You don't just um, you don't just like deploy people out there and just and just go like, oh, we have that now. Like you have to build those things, right? And so you know, right? For building. I, I don't. I, I, I'm going to get myself in trouble if I go too far into it, but. We both we both mutually support each other in like getting ready to do whatever come comes next, and I think that I think it's pretty cool. I think it's cool opportunity. Now, when that turns into like, is, am I going to go get in the Pacific Ocean and help you rescue somebody? No, you're on your own. Good luck. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Thank you for your service. Fair enough. And like, <laughs> hey, I, I think the new phrase is you're supposed to thank me for yeah, your yeah. freedom. I don't know They're, if service don't members are There's supposed to. In the ocean. Uh, I'm not going in. There, right? <laughs> <laughs> if there is anybody, if there's anybody more terrified and aware of a shark in the ocean, it is yeah. me. Let me take you back, my yeah. friend. It was 2000. It, this had to be 2000. And I don't know. It had to be after 2008 in between like the 2009. I was in England. I went to California with another good friend. Oh, no, I was in Vegas. So it was like 2015. Because Vegas and England are like we go the over to thing. Those are just... I well, it was the same. It was the same guy. Okay. Right. It was it was the same guy that I worked with. I'm not trying to put his name out because he's sure, in North yeah, Carolina yeah. now. But I was I was there with this dude, and we were in we were off the coast of San Diego. Mm-hmm. And right, <clears throat> so in order for you to be seen in the, it's really hard. Everybody that doesn't understand yeah. ocean like rescue, even under nods, it is impossible to see a single oh, person yeah. in the ocean. Yeah, you're, gonna, you're gonna die just out yeah. there, <laughs> a day or life. It, it is so hard to yeah. find you, right? So we're 20 miles off the coast, 10 to 15 foot rollers, and it's at night. And we have to be just lit up like Christmas mm-hmm. trees. All right. What attracts sharks? Lights. Okay. Fear. And then they number two, you. well, fear, <laughs> that's always inherent. And then three, helicopters. Helicopters sound like a panicking school sure, of fish. Sure, yeah. And the sharks show up. So they, they pull in, they drop us off, they do this thing, they go around and do their yeah. pattern. And just for a second, my friend and I, who were dressed in very seal, like a uh, sea lion yeah. color, gray yeah. suits, just flashing everywhere. <laughs> and we sound like a school of fish and we're very large. He and I are sitting there and I was like, this is the most scared I've ever been. I'm going to pretend the ocean isn't just monster soup yeah, yeah. that is just waiting to eat yeah. me and I don't belong here until, and then by the way, the helicopter tried to kill us. Of course. They always, do. Uh, like I distinctly remember we get down and, uh, I, we were with an AIE mm-hmm. student and uh, he was getting his master upgrade. So me and the other team leader, I was over his shoulder and, uh, the other guy would go on the first one. And then this is the second mm-hmm. one, right? So I'm in the door, we pull down and the helicopter is 10 foot seas. Yeah. And I'm like, you're supposed to be 10 foot above the wave top. Mm-hmm. Right. And then I'm supposed to judge when I jump in so that like, if you don't jump at the top of the wave, then you're going to miss it. And then if it's a 10 foot sea and they're 10 foot above that, that's a 20 foot drop. You don't want to do that. So I am intently watching how close the water is to the, to the yeah. boat so that I, or to the aircraft so that I can jump at the right time. The helicopter keeps going lower and lower <laughs> and lower and I'm not on comms. And in my head, I'm like, Hey guys, we're awful yeah. low. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. like, 
can you tell me to go? Like I'm literally looking at the AIE master and the other team leader over my shoulder. I'm like, can you, can you tell me to go? I, I don't want to be in this aircraft yeah, yeah, yeah. and this happens. So I get the pat and I get to go and I time it to the top. I don't, I can't remember exactly how high we were, but I put myself out. I posted on the door and I moved. I thought, and at my hand, it was one of those things where I pushed off like yeah. this. And then my hand like stayed on as I rotated because you put your back to the nose of the aircraft. Yeah. As I rotated, I kind of like left my hand as a guide to make sure I didn't run into the helicopter on the way. And as I reached my hand up and I was like letting go of the helicopter, I thought I felt my fins touch the water. And I was like, that's too close. <laughs> and I just got underwater. I was like, which way is the helicopter going? This way? I need to swim yeah. this way because that's how close I was. We talked about it in the debrief. And I was like, guys, how close were we to the yeah. water when we first deployed? And and everybody was like, it felt close, it right? Felt close. And it was like, was close, right? everybody, everybody agrees. Everybody agrees with that. <laughs> it felt, it felt yeah. close to me, you know? Um, but the, the ocean is monster soup, and that crap is terrifying. Yeah. I have the TACP version of that story. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hit me with it, my dude. Hit me with it. So earlier this year, uh, at my previous assignment, we were doing an exercise out in California. And probably the same area you were in. We were using San Clemente Island and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I don't know what that is, 20 miles? I, I don't know. I don't do math. Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. so I'm a, I'm, at this point, I am a E7 TACP, and that's important for a couple of reasons that we'll we'll get to. <laughs> and uh, we're going to fly this helicopter from beautiful San Diego to San beautiful Clemente Island. The gas lamp. Like, you know, it's the right there, right? Like, I'll see it. It's not that far. And so we're in this uh, this Black Hawk, and and of course, you know, it's it seats out, and I'm like, I'm sitting in the door. Come on, dog. I'm a, I'm I'm sitting in the door, right? So I'm sitting in the door, feet are dangling. We're going out over the go over the ocean. And like literally the second that we cross over to the ocean, I'm like, oh, I'm a tacky. Uh, we're, we're now over the ocean, but I'm like looking at it and I'm like, <laughs> all right. If this is like, you want to like tell somebody, Hey guys, yeah, yeah. uh, guys, well, cause I'm in a plane. Of, Are you aware we're over the yeah, ocean? I'm in a plane full of combat controllers. And I'm like, this is wait, wait, wait a minute. This is wrong. Nope. Nope. And so we go over the ocean and I'm like looking at the water. I'm like, okay, if this helicopter explodes right now and I fall into the ocean, I got to swim that way. I'm thinking about it. I'm like visualizing <laughs> how I'm going to survive <laughs> crashing into I the love Pacific it. Ocean. Well, I thought this flight was going to be like five minutes and then like 45 minutes into this flight, there's just open ocean in every direction. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm Terrifying, right? Die is what's going to happen. Like, yeah. No, that's I it. Hope I don't survive the crash because I don't want to have to figure out how to get out of this. And, uh, man, my first rescue, my first rescue was they, we were at, uh, Roco. So we were at a confined space yeah. course. They called us back and they were like, Hey, there's two options. There's a six sailor on this Filipino, uh, really big super tanker. We have to go get him. He's got appendicitis. He's got to come back. So they're like, hey, the option that's going to work is there's two C-130s. They're going to drop a Rams package. We're going to put the A team on those boats. They're going to jump in with the Rams. They're going to get recovered to the larger vessel. It's going to be all good. We're going to put a helo team together just in case. No big deal. They're, and I was brand new. So no kidding, I was the youngest guy on this rescue and my team leader that worked up the street at the ACC unit. So we were in the 321st and then they were at the 56th RQS. Mm -hmm. It was in England. So my team leader looked at me and I'll never forget. He was like, hey, get your mind right. There's no way the jump's happening. They're like, he's like, this is the North Sea. Mm -hmm. This is 400 miles off the coast of Ireland. You're not, we are going mm -hmm. in. And I was just like, uh, okay. So no kidding, just before we left the coast of Ireland, we had refueled and they were spilling fuel. There was a little bit of fuel that was coming back onto the cockpit. And they were like, yeah, we can't have this happen. We land at a farm, no, not an HLZ, a flat piece of earth. The FE gets out, goes around and he, the refueling probe, he just kicks it <laughs> and it like, and you hear this thunk. He was like, yeah, man. So when the probe like refuels, basically for it to take fuel, it has to push in this mm -hmm. detent. And then it like it lets fuel and he's like, sometimes it doesn't reset. Yeah. So sometimes you just got to kick it and it resets. Yeah. And then we took off and there were two more refuelings from there to the mm -hmm. boat. I, when I was hoisting down, 
I looked in every direction and it was all ocean. Scariest yeah. I've ever felt in my yeah. entire life. You're dead. And I was like, like that okay, work, you're, no, you're, goodbye. this is it. No. Yeah. yeah, boy. And uh, the so the reason that we even went in is because the C-130, the clouds were at like a five, 400 feet or yeah. something. And it was just socked in. It was 400 feet to a thousand feet. It was just socked in. And, he, and my team leader told me, he's like, see, <laughs> he's like, we're going to fly right in. We're going to hoist you down. I, w- I was just like, hey, man, uh, I'm terrified. Yeah, yeah this, this sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, what's your, uh, what's your favorite funny deployment story? Mm. Like, not, not like, um, not like I'm, you know, terrified I'm going to die yeah. or, you know, most heinous thing, but like, what is, what is your most funny deployment story? I'm going to start. Right. I'm going to give you time right. to yeah, think about it. I need it. So I was the SEL. We were in Bastion. We were shutting it down. I get a call very late at night. Well, so I, I, I will take it back. It was not very late mm. at night. It was at like eight o'clock at night when I got in. So I worked seven at night to seven in the morning. My officer counterpart worked seven in the morning to seven at night. We split the shifts. The shifts were on a different time schedule. So I got to see half of the night shift and half of the day shift. And he got to do mm. the same. What we did for range time, because we were still on alert at this time, it was like 2000. I mean, it had to be 2015 Afghanistan yeah. in Bastion. We were still doing the Kazvac mission. So uh, 2013, 2014 in Bastion, whenever it shut down for us, because I shut it down. Um, what we would do is we'd schedule range time, but we would schedule it for an hour of the late team shift at the end. So they would stay up essentially an hour later. Mm-hmm. And then the other team would wake up an hour earlier on Tuesday. So we'd have two hours of range time but one team was staying up an hour later and the other team was waking up an hour earlier. So one team would do it before their shift and one team would do it after. I get a call and they were like, Hey, we have an issue. One of your guys killed a vehicle. And I was like, I'm sorry, that doesn't sound like a problem. And he was like, well, here's the deal. It was, it was your own vehicle. And I was like, okay. So he's like, uh, here's the problem. And this is a Colonel on 06, by the way. And he was like, here's the problem your guy after the range cleaned his weapon, put it together and function checked it for his incoming Mm -hmm. shift. Like he was, he woke up early uh, and was about to go on shift and he was like, and he function checked it, but way he did it from the middle of the back seat. And when he did with it pointed as the floor at the floor. And when he squeezed the trigger, somehow he loaded a round into it and it shot right through the oil pan of the truck. And it actually totaled the truck. Oh my God. (laughs) Because it killed the truck. Yeah. And I was like, so what you're telling me is a guy had an ND. The team leader was telling me that was there. He was like, yeah, I was putting a, a ruck into the back of this truck. Like when we were leaving the range and the middle of the truck, I heard the sound, but I thought that I had hit the side of the truck with mm-hmm. my ruck. Like I thought as I like shouldered my ruck into the truck, I yeah. hit it. And that was the noise that I heard. But when I looked in the cab, it was completely full of that moon dust that after Af- mm-hmm. or the uh, Afghanistan moon yep. dust that got everywhere. He was like the muzzle flash basically made it whatever. And when I opened the door, it was like a movie smoke just poured out. It was that moon dust. And my boy was looking at me and he was just like, (laughs) my bad, dude, my bad, dude. dude." And he was just like, we got to call Aaron. (laughs) So, uh, it turns out he killed the truck. He got a suspended article 15 which never followed him home. The guy was like, listen, as long as you're good here, he's like, I got to give you an article 15. You fucking let a a round loose out of your gun. And everybody was like, yeah, Yeah. that's fair. Uh, However, it all worked out to just be okay. And then when this guy went home, the the one, this PJ had a confirmed rifle kill of one (laughs) HH six pack. (laughs) I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. Fantastic. Like, not a lot of PJs got rifle kills, yeah. dog, but this guy killed a vehicle, like a, a giant, like the, your classic Toyota Hilux that was stick shift yeah. that we don't know where it came from, uh, whatever. But th- that's easily one of my top two yeah. deployment stories that are funny. I mean, the funniest one that I have is, is uh, I, I can't, you know, say it on YouTube. Uh, so <laughs> Fair. Uh Man, you're fuck. I, you know, I had a couple, and now that I'm thinking about it, I'm I'm like kind of drawing a blank because the thing is, is like the stuff gets so dumb, right? Like, like I think about the infantry platoon that decided to throw a rave by uh, breaking chemsticks open and like dumping glow in the dark crap all 
I just did this on YouTube. Didn't That's I? cancer, uh, brother. Someone, yeah, so, someone get Hunter Seven Foundation yeah, on yeah, the phone yeah, right so, now. You know, it's like blackout on the fob, and you got forty three infantry guys dancing and glow in the dark paint all over. <laughs> Incredibly <laughs> stupid, right? But hilarious at the time. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I love it. I love it so yeah. much that you just can't even, you can't even describe right. it. And that's what I tell people about team jokes. I'm like, Hey, are you, people that are close to me, they're like, what are you guys laughing about? I'm like, all right, listen, yeah. it's gonna take there's going to be no way for me to, yeah. <laughs> and then it's not going to be yeah. funny. And then you're just not going to, and then I'm going to be mad at you for not finding yeah. it funny because we found it <laughs> hilarious. Let's hit a, let me hit you with a real talk. How, how do you, how, how do you follow a leader that you don't like? Man, yeah. we we follow leaders that we don't like all the time, right? Uh, Man, how do you get your mind right? You you have to, you know, like you you don't have a choice. I I mean, you're in the military, and I I think that's um, it's it's both like a cop out and also a it, it's something to lean on. Like you're you're in the military. Your commander sucks. Well, he's a commander. The end. You know, and I've listen. I I got back from a, a deployment. And we had this commander. He's like the interim commander because I think the real commander was deployed. It got weird. Anyway, he's like, hey, uh, you mm-hmm. guys, our families are like in the parking lot waiting for us to like put our crap in our cages and, and be done. And he's like, yeah, man, just knock out your uh, CBTs before you leave. Well, people who may not be familiar with that, that's there's like 20 hours of CBTs. Dude, that's like, this guy wants so to long of CBTs. Like two days doing PowerPoint slideshows. And so we just, you know, I mean, we just didn't. But I'm not saying that that's that's you know that's not the solution. Right? So I'm not telling people to just be right. But you have to. You, what you do is you, yeah, yeah. you separate out um, the things that you don't have a choice. I mean, people outrank you. People are, are commanders, commission officers, whatever. Like there are things that you may not like it, but you just you have to do it. Um, and you actually get yourself into a lot of trouble when you when you start um, not doing that. Um, and actually, mm-hmm. you know, there's there's drama at every unit about stuff like that. But at the end of the day, like there's there's one commander sure. I mean, you're in the military. So do what you're told and complain about it. I'm the king of complaining about it while I'm doing the things that I was told to do. Right. And so uh, it's the it's the best part about being in the military yeah. is getting to complain with your yeah. friends about the things that you contractually agreed yeah. to do. You 100 percent. Just you agreed to do this thing, but we are going to yeah, bitch about yeah, it. Yeah, I will do it. Well, so I complain a lot about it while I'm doing it. So here's but my uh, here's my follow on then. So, that's, that's, I would say that would be the one thing that that's where you fall off and and you lose support and nobody's going to help you. Like you were told to do something, so do it. If you can't do that, don't join. Agree. So how do you lead people mm-hmm. that may not like you? <laughs> I mean, I'd be basically everybody. Nobody likes me here. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I had John. That's why it's just you and me. Listen, yeah. bro. I, there's a reason why it's just yeah, you yeah. and me right now. It's, be- it's because we are a twin flames <laughs> in this universe. I, I understand. How, how, do you, how do you lead people that you know, like, number one, that you don't like? Because hey, newsflash, everybody, you don't like everybody right. that you work right. with. You don't get along with everybody that you work with. People have terrible things about me to say in the PJ community right now. And they're valid. And guess what? I have bad things to say about my leaders too. And guess what? They're, they're valid. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, these things happen, but if we get back to the business of war fighting, we are here to conduct warfare Mm -hmm. on behalf of the United States. We are not here to get along. We are here to get it the fuck on my, uh, so how, how do you, (laughs) how do you arrow? How do you, how do you lead people? that you may not agree so with. Op soup is paired up with the, the DO, right? The director of operations or ops officer, whatever you want to call it. My yep. current DO. I love it. I got my K I got my K dub. Yeah. I got my K dub and I love it. My him. current uh, my current DO has written on his whiteboard in his office that uh, we're in the it's Air Force, not Air Friends. <laughs> and I laugh every time I see it. <laughs> I laugh every time I see it. I'm like, yeah. Air yeah. Force it's Air Force, not, not Air, Air Friends. Friends. I Air love Force. it. So, I love yeah. it. And I think, I think, like again, like maybe it's kind of a crutch, but it is. It's also there's like freedom in just accepting that this is the military. And so, same thing. Like if I if I have guys that I know don't like me, or everybody likes me, but if they don't agree with what I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, tough, tough, man. Like 
part of that is being credible, right? So like, don't ask, it's standard leadership stuff, right? Don't ask people to do things that you wouldn't do yourself. Don't give unlawful orders. Mm -hmm. If you're going to make a correction, like be right, you know, like don't people, they don't tell people they can't do something that the reg clearly says they can, like, you got to know the the Mm -hmm. standards that you're, you're doing. But, um, if what you're doing is, is correct, then they don't have to like you. I mean, that, that's just kind of the end of it. Like, um, and it sucks. I'm not saying that it's easy. I, I am a guy that I do want everybody to like me, but at the same time, there's a right way to do things and, and that, or, or there's my way that is a right way. And I am allowed to, to set that because I'm in the position I'm in. And so it's like, this is what we're doing and you don't have to like it, but you do have to do it. And it's the same thing up, up the chain, right? Like I may not agree with the deal or the commander or, or higher level guidance or, or I mean, you, go, you can go all the way into, into politics. You know, everybody has a different opinion on, on governments and things like that. But you joined the military, you took an oath that you were going to obey the, off, the orders of the officers and the president. And you agreed to be led by NCOs and, and all that kind of stuff. And then when you are that person, um, when you have to make unpopular decisions and things like that, like, that's why you get paid big bucks, man. That's why I get hundred dollars a month more than you because I get to tell you if you get a blast of food. Like, <laughs> it's just that's just how it works. Not everybody's gonna be your friend. Not everybody's gonna like you. I love you it. Got to do it, um, but you got to be right. Yeah. I mean, you're gonna be right. I had a great. Uh, if you know that all your subordinates hate you, you better be right because <laughs> then they can't argue with yeah. you. Yeah. So. Holy cow! You you better be super yeah. right. You better never. You better know those regs yeah. like the back <laughs> yeah. of your hand. I had a, a a great career field manager that once said, "You know, I'd like everybody to agree with me, but in the end, I'm going to make a decision. Mm-hmm. So what I want is consensus, but in the end, I don't need your consent." Yeah. That's always been a great yeah. quote for me for for leadership in yeah. general. You know, um, and I think uh, to some oh, to some ex- No, no, go. Well, I was I was thinking. Um, Cause sometimes, you know, I'm starting to get into these like big blue things to quote an earlier uh, oh, yeah. argument, but, um, and even the generational debate we had before it, um, I think if there, but I would say if there was one thing that I could ask, uh, the younger people, uh, or like your audience or whatever is like, just give, give the people over you the benefit of the doubt and until proven otherwise, like assume that they're acting in good faith, like you may not yeah. like the decisions that are being made, but you don't know all the information that they have. Like if you're a freaking E3, yep. you don't know what the commander knows. You don't, you're never going to quit thinking that you do. And he may make it until you're the, until you're the SEL. Right. And, and you, you know what I mean? Like you have no clue. Yeah. And, and the other part of that too is, is on the NCO side is like I said, like, and as you alluded to, um, I could go in the office of the DO and him and I can argue about doing something, but, I'm a bad NCO. I'm a shitty op soup. If I come out of that room, not supporting his decision, he's in charge, not me. You can't. Same thing with the commander, nope. right? Yeah. Everything, it's the same concept well, he, as you he, go up the chain. Let, let me pause you. You said something. Words have meanings. <laughs> he's in command. We're in charge. Yeah. When we, when, when, when you're, you're 100% right. I am a shitty op soup. If I walk out of that, like I, I love KW. Mm-hmm. KW and I disagree all the time. We have great conversations back and forth. My job as the NCO, when you're an NCO, your job, and this goes all the way back to the very beginnings of what we call a military. Mm-hmm. If you want to go all the way back to, you know, Sparta, if you want to go all the way back, the NCO, their number one job was to protect the officer, mm-hmm. to be their guide, to give them recommendations, to make sure that they were good. But the the number one reason that there were NCOs, non-commissioned officers, their number one job, it was like, it originated from being the bodyguard of the officer, right? If you leave that NC, that officer's office and you do not carry his message as if it was your own, you're undermining yeah, every you're single wrong. piece of authority that you have. You're, you're just doing it wrong. I agree with you. That guy is in command. Mm-hmm. We are in charge. And if you do not get on board with that, that officer, if you're not willing, like, Followership is just as important as leadership and submission is different than followership. I want to put this Mm -hmm. out there. Uh, You know, I'm not submitting. I'm not rolling over. It's not the NCO's job to rolling over. As a matter of fact, it's the NCO's job. When everybody in the, in the room is saying yes, it's your job as that NCO to say no. It's your job to be like, no, 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 no. 
we, we got to look at this harder. We got to figure out how this is affecting the mm. men. We got to figure like, it's your job to be that. But once the decision is made, once that table is slapped, it's your duty mm. to go out of that team room and be like, nope, I'm going to support this shit. And we're, we're going right. like, this is what so we're, we're doing. doing. And I'm in charge of making it happen. And I think that's where, I think that's where a lot of the breakdown maybe breakdown. I don't know. But when you get into the generational stuff and, and especially, and I was the same way, I, I guarantee you the people, if anybody is watching this, that was like in charge of me, they're laughing and they're like, yeah, I told you asshole. Like, yes. Okay. We're, we're like an hour yeah. in to the second part. I think nobody, we're at like an hour and 25 in. Yeah. Listen, yeah, nobody's yeah. watching. Yeah. It's like an, if a tree falls in the forest, you can say whatever leadership <laughs> yeah, quote yeah, that you yeah. want right now. Nobody's yeah. watching. But like, it, it is just, it's just at the end of the day, it's the military, man. Like people are in charge and people are not. And then there's one person, there's the commander. Commander says this is what we're doing. And that's, that's the end of it. Like, and I think there's freedom yep. in that though. Like a lot of guys get all uh, bent out of shape and they spend a lot of time worrying about stuff. And it's just like, dude, it doesn't matter. Like the commander said what we're doing. So chill out. This is what the boss yeah. wants. Let's just go do it. Do yeah. It. No, imagine civilians go their entire lives and you know what their number one gripe is i don't know what my purpose is somebody's going to get if you <laughs> wait long enough in the military if you if you just like stay yeah. long enough somebody's going to look at you and be like here's my vision statement here's my mission mm. statement here's my mission i need you to do these things and they're very specific yeah. in our world they write things called orders op orders op plans con plans o plans they will tell you straight up this is what I want. These are my specified tasks. These are my implied mm -hmm. tasks. Here's the things that I want you to do. Holy crap. It's like a checklist. Right. Did I do all of these things? Couldn't be easier. Yeah. All right. What's your favorite thing to do in the military? Period. It doesn't have to be tack P stuff. Mm. Your favorite thing about being in military service. Is it? Is it? I'm just going to get this out of the way. <laughs> For me, because I'm a narcissist, I hope somebody clips this. It's me, for me, it's loading on every airline that I'm on <laughs> first. That's my favorite part about being in the military. Yeah, and the Golden Corral on Veterans Day, man. I just I eat for free yeah. every year, dog. Well, what's your favorite part about being in the? I'm like scared to answer it because th this is one of those things that everybody will sit around and they'll be they'll say things like, "Man, I'm just I'm just, I don't want to play the game. Screw that." And then when their friends aren't around, they're like, "How do I get promoted? Like, how do I play the game?" Right? But then you get in a crowd, and they're like, "No, nah, uh -huh. I don't want to do that." I guarantee you, everybody loves like the first time that they're or maybe not the first time, but like everybody likes their hero photos. Everybody likes putting their blues on and, and mom being proud. Everybody likes that stuff, but it's Dude. not cool to admit it. Dude. It's not okay to tell people that you enjoy that kind of stuff. You know, like. Uh, but it's that it's that pride and feeling something, and yeah. it's corny. It is, but it's that pride and feeling something bigger than yourself. It's you know what? You I've never felt more. Right? Can like that's why you joined the dude. Military, but now you're not. You can't enjoy it anymore. Loser. It's I like, love my dad. My dad is a, my dad's a firefighter. Mm -hmm. He's been a firefighter for thirty years. Yeah. He's doing ambulance work now. He 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 retired at, out of our small town. He was a full time firefighter. I had a great home life mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Like I was the privilege you've heard right. about married family, huge, like six kids, uh, all like all the, we didn't have a white picket fence, but we deserved <laughs> one. I can't believe we didn't have it. Um, I never felt more connected to my dad yeah. when I, when he came to my basic training graduation, he, he wasn't even in the military for that right. long. He he was in for four years. He did an assignment after Vietnam because he just barely missed the war and then they didn't do anything. So he was like, all right, cool. And he started his firefighter yeah. career. That's how his life went. I never felt more connected to that man ever when he told me that he, that I look good in uniform. Right. You, man, there is a pride mm. that you feel with other, because that connects you not to yourself. Mm. That connects you to the Rangers at Point to Hawk. That connects you to the SEALs on the 9-11 raid. That connects you to everybody that was in Eagle Claw. That connects you to everybody that was in uh, Black Hawk Down. Mm that we started talking about earlier. Tim Wilkinson, he and I, the, our uniforms don't look the same. Our medals definitely don't <laughs> look the same. But I'll tell you what, if, if you took that out and you were just like, hey, what does this look like? You'll be able to tell that's an Air Force uniform. Mm -hmm. It's a blessing and a curse where you can be like, hey, I'm part of this tribe. I'm part of this community. Yeah. And I have a lot to live up to. I, dude, 
kudos to you, my friend, <laughs> for for providing yeah. that optic because I, I agree. I, I think when you do have um, that connection to something greater than yourself, you're not stealing that valor. You're not you're not ab- absorbing yeah. what they did, but you're like, no, this is our squad. This is our team. This is who we are. This is our culture. Yeah, my uh, I got married a couple of years ago. And my my brother uh, did the service. My brother was at this point retired from the Navy. Um, my oldest brother was a, a corpsman, attached to Marines. He was in both invasions of Iraq. He was in Somalia pre, you know, Black Hawk Down. He was lead medic at Guantanamo Bay. Like, been there, done that kind of dude. What a career. The- That's ridiculous. Re- Ridiculous. Right, and the only photo that exists of us together in our uniforms is my wedding, right? And things things like that are, and it's also Dude. the only time uh, that my my wife's family has ever seen me in uniform. It's like the second time that my mom yeah. saw me in blues. Like those things don't come yep. around a lot, and th- those kind of uh, those kind of opportunities are uh, they're very rare, and, and when they happen, you're like. Yeah, all right, this is pretty cool. Like, I don't even care if I get clowned on. Like, yeah. this is awesome, right? And so, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, but military free fall is pretty cool too. So, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm the oldest of six kids. Four of my brother, like the four. There's four boys and two girls, right? So, um, three of my younger brothers all started off in the infantry. So two of them are helicopter pilots. Now my brother, Kyle does signals intelligence. He set up the first EW, uh, basically EW battalion in the army. Right. Um, in 2000 and to flesh this story out from 2002 until 2014, one of us was deployed the entire time. So uh, as many as three of us were deployed at any given Mm -hmm. time, my brother Brian and my brother Danny both got hit when the army was doing stop loss Mm -hmm. of their dudes and they were extending deployments. They both did near back to back 18 month deployments. So my brother Brian was in Tikrit from like 2004 until 2008. Like no kidding. He was there for 18 months, like 2004. So that got him through halfway 2005. He worked another deployment and then like he deployed again in 2007 and then that took him through halfway 2000 yeah. like no kidding and then like at one point three of us were downrange mm-hmm. right um my mom asked us 2016 marked the time that one of us wouldn't be deployed she was like hey christmas 2016 none of you all are going to be deployed i need every one of you to be in barbara in ohio mm-hmm. And I need you to bring your service dress because I want to go to church and I want all four of my boys in their, in their yeah. uniform. And we were just like, <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. the middle of G watt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it was the middle of so G watt. We didn't want to <laughs> aggrandize ourselves, dude. And again, just like you're saying, man, it was six month deployments on and off, on and off, on and off. Some, my brother's spending time over there, Iraq and Afghanistan, both. I got to be honest with you. Like just being in that row, with four of us in, you know, and we took the requisite pictures yeah. and stuff, but man, there was a pride and it wasn't of our personal accomplishments. It was, there were three guys from the army and one guy from the air force and we had all done something mm-hmm. and we were there together. Yeah. And that was what America was yeah. like. We, fa- that was, that was family. Mm-hmm. That was defense of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That was man. Let's, You know, the call came up and this family, we answered the call and it wasn't about us. It was about the military. Mm -hmm. It was about, it was about the country. But you're not allowed to tell your friends that. That was important. (laughs) You couldn't. No, exactly. No. Well, I guess I did now. I guess that was the the worst. uh, Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Don't worry, my dear. There's a, there's a lot more things that uh, I've been out of over. (laughs) Um, so, Hey, can you do me yeah. a favor? I did, uh, I did reach out to the dudes oh, and I did ask a couple okay. questions. I, uh, I guess I had to ask, uh, what's a, what's a renaming ceremony? Oh God. Like, <laughs> like if you have to, I mean, I don't want to end on this. I'm, I'm going to read the quote directly. Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, (laughs) but yeah, here, here we go. And it it is from peaches. I'm supposed to ask you what's a hostile renaming and how did it go that night? And then we're, we're going to close after this one. 
So I'm going to give the floor to you, but there's a hot, we, we already talked about it. When you graduate a weapons school, you get a call yep. sign. And I will quote my friend Shane. My friend Shane is a uh, man. He's a PJ. He's been a PJ for more than mm-hmm. 20 years. Shane has the funniest quotes about call signs. He's like, you know why call signs are fake? Because if you introduce yourself as Rocket in the beginning, I can't look you up on the fucking yeah, global yeah, as Rocket I, and send dude, you an so email. Many problems with that. You're making. We have that all the time. Be like, you're hey, making a. You know what hey, uh, hey what's, what's, I don't know how to email him. Really yeah. Like, hey, <laughs> hey, what's Blunder's yeah. email? Hey, does anybody? <laughs> hey. Does does anybody have ball sacks uh WhatsApp? So man, so you get you get a you get a name, but sometimes there's a renaming. I w- I want to welcome everybody into the circle a little bit. Tell us what's a hostile renaming. So uh call signs are are generally a pilot thing, at least in my understanding. Um so they they don't have to go to WIC to get a call sign. This is this happens once they are a, they're a real right. boy and they can fly the plane. Uh they'll they'll get a call sign. Okay. And there's a whole ceremony involved and it's you know it's just dumb drinking games and and trash talk and and that kind of stuff so that happens in your in at some point in your career and you, and you get your call sign uh, a hostile renaming is when the community has decided that your call sign doesn't fit and that you need a new one uh it's also an opportunity okay. to extort somebody uh because what will happen is the said community that wants to rename you they will uh, essentially they'll put up money, they'll donate money to the bar, whatever bar you're currently tearing down be like, Hey, we've got a hundred dollars. So they'll lobby. Yeah, so they'll you're, lobby. so you're saying there's yes, lobbyists, yeah. right? And they're like, Hey, <laughs> we got, a, and usually it'll be related to like the, the JTAC wick is part of the 66 weapon squadron. So we're going to be like, Hey, we got $66 to rename this dude. And they're rare. I, I want to point this out that they're, they're rare. You're not supposed to get renamed. It well, Something has have to have happened to where, there is now a funnier story. Call signs have to have a story behind them. It's a there is now right. a it's a big story. event, and and so okay, the, the community, right. your friends, or whatever, they go like, hey, we got sixty six dollars or however many. Uh, we're we're going to rename you, and then that person has the opportunity to go. I'm going to pay sixty seven dollars to keep my name, and then you start outbidding each other. The if the lobby wins and they always do because you're talking about it's like twenty on they one. Always right? do. It's more yeah. people, right? Uh, and, and by the way, if if I'm voting for anything, I'm voting for chaos. Yeah, right. So I'm like, oh, re, re- yes. renaming this people? Yeah. No, I'm 100 percent all day, this, all right? yeah. And then what? So, 100%. so then when the lobbyists win, it now becomes it's it's kind of back to the way the original naming was, where everybody just starts spitting out ideas, and you you generally kind of know. Uh, so you go like you, you, you write up all the, all the things that are going to be, I'm not going to get into that on, on, on YouTube. Uh, but you know, you, you suggest <laughs> or yeah, anywhere, or anywhere ever. Some things are meant for the right, team right, room, right? right. So you, no, you come fair. Up with, okay. with like, new ideas and then you vote and you pick one, but you're also like screwing with the guy the whole time, you know? So it's like everyone, you usually kind of have, you already kind of know what it's going to be because clearly something has happened to to warrant this right. renaming. So you right. already kind of know what it's going to be, but you're still going to take the couple hours to drink a lot of beer and, and make fun of the guy and come up with elaborate reasons why it might be something else, you know, like you have to do your due diligence, right. Right. you know, right. you have Maybe to be there's an even better idea yeah. out there. Yeah. So it's, uh, it probably <laughs> sucks for the guy getting renamed. I, I haven't experienced it. Uh, it's just a constant roast yeah, fest. The entire just getting time. Roasted and okay. extorted for money and made fun of. <laughs> And they don't know what's going to happen. I okay. mean, they might they might end up with a terrible call sign. They don't know, but uh, then it usually end, you know we're we're always going to give a guy a call sign they can use. You know, this still has to be professional and all that kind of stuff. But right. the route we take there might not be. All right. Well, arrow short for air again. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to open the floor to you. We all we always ask for advice at the mm-hmm. end of the podcast. Man, this has been such a great talk. You're allowed anytime. Anytime you just hit us up, you're back on right. whatever. But from you, just (laughs) just from you, man, what advice you got for those people out there? Like, what what is something that you see lacking that you just wish people would focus on a little bit? Well, you know, I already I kind of already talked to um, you know the people that were thinking about joining Aspect War or whatever, and and I maintain everything I said. Um, I think more j- kind of like advice for just younger people, like young airmen or, or people that, you know, you're going to come in and you're going to do a lot of stuff, but like eventually you're going to be done with the pipeline and stuff. And um, 
Well, I was kind of alluding it to that when I said earlier, I was like, okay, you fail. Worst case scenario, you're still in the Air Force. Like you're still in a good career. Yeah. So um, take advantage of it. Just because you're a PJ or a TAC P, a combat controller, SR, whatever, you're not too cool to to go to school and use your TA or uh, get your all your bumps and bruises documented so that you get that VA rating later or take advantage of things like military one source. Like it's okay to be crazy and need to talk to somebody like use everything that is available. When you deploy, there's these savings programs like be smart with your money, get ahead of it early, use the TSP. Don't leave your TSP in bonds only. Like there's so much stuff that you need to be doing as an adult that you are not too cool for just because you got a cool French hat now, like use this stuff. I, I, you know, I have a, a couple of degrees that I didn't pay for because I just looked at TA as, as like, if I don't use all my tuition assistance, I'm leaving money on the table. And then, you know, you just chug along and chug along. And one day you've been in 10 years and you have a master's degree. Like it, it is actually kind of that easy. Like you just do it. Just the, the things are there, the resources are there, the benefits are there use them on top of that you're not too cool for the air force you're in the air force to learn how the air force works learn how to write learn how to supervise learn how to be an airman because uh someday they're they're going to come calling and you're going to have to take advantage of that stuff so that's in the future that doesn't matter like when you're training it doesn't matter while you're in your pipeline and all that kind of stuff but uh you never made it you're never too cool for for all the things that are out there and, and just be be an airman be an adult be a professional in whatever it is that you end up doing. I don't know if you're aware of it. I'm pretty good at figuring out what is a great YouTube clip. <laughs> but damn it, son, you just you just dropped a gem on them. You just dropped what the kids call a knowledge bomb. JP, Justin Perrin, thank you so much for coming on. We're going to end it there. You are the man. Anytime you want to come back on, you let us know. Next, next I appreciate time I'm, you. I'm in my Everybody office. else. That next time that's happening. All right. <laughs> I love it. I, full disclosure. Any like for the four fans that are still listening <laughs> right now, I see you. But uh, I told him he had to be in his hot tub for this one. And he didn't. Ah, so he didn't yeah, uh, yeah. come. Everybody go to the page. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Follow us. JP, thanks for coming on, man. You. Can't wait to see these FTU episodes. Yeah, drop. Ready. You're the man. Awesome. Everybody else, train hard. See you next time.